check digit in your plane's chronometers indicates an unverifiable deviation from the astronomical baseline. Oh, well, then we have even more reason to be thankful for your return. Enough, Nyla. We do not come to Arcona to discuss technicalities. We come to prepare for war. Lorehammer Library! Has there ever been a day like this? Said Governor Tarkel Roshin, puffing out his chest and brushing imagined specks of dust from the puffed sleeves of his fur-lined pelisse. Gold thread woven through the material made it sparkle in the late morning sunlight and accentuated the deep crimson of his bronze button tunic and polished boots. Not in living memory, my lord, answered Nuri, adjusting the golden scabbard at the governor's hip. How long has it been? Two hundred and sixty-three years, my lord. A glorious day for Arcona, said Roshin. A glorious day for you, my lord. Roshin nodded. Pleased Nuri understood the nuances inherent in this moment. He expected no less. His body slave was tentative to detail, and Roshin was forced to concede that the man had done a commendable job in making sure he was presentable. On a day like today, appearances were everything. A shame, then, that Roshin was forced to share the dignitary's pavilion with his fellow planetary officials. The heads of Arcona's noble houses had come with swollen entourages, military escorts, and a level of pomp that might be expected were the Emperor himself to set foot on Protoss. Not that any of the other nobles could match the spectacle the wealth of Protoss could provide. Roshin glanced up but the sky was heavy with low cloud and atmospheric disturbances from the fleet in low orbit. No sign of any land as yet, but as far as Roshin could see, Aquila Primus spaceport was awash with immaculately presented specimens of Arconan soldiery, epitomizing the efficient, loyal and productive world that he presided over. Planetary defence regiments by the score mustered in the shadows of the bustling port's towering lifter rigs and launch cradles. Tens of thousands of men, well-trained, well-armed and fiercely proud, arranged in resplendent ranks amid a sea of vividly hued banners and glittering eagles. A hundred or more bands filled the air with rousing martial tunes, as booming hymnals bore words of piety skyward from the Ecclesiarchy's capital imperialis devotionals. Orbital traffic had been grounded for the day, and though the parsimonious mercantile guilds had wailed in protest, Roshin's decree was absolute. Today the skies belong to the visitors. Today the Imperium returned to Arcona. Tamara of Aridus had come clad in a voluminous jilbab of russet brown that did little to conceal her swollen belly in which she grew yet another air. Roshin wrinkled his nose as he caught a faint whiff of the industrial-grade chemical fertilizers in the folds of her robes. How many does that make now, Lady Tamara? This will be my thirteenth child, Lord Roshin. Thirteen! Emperor's mercy, said Roshin with a shake of his head. I know our Edus is fertile, but it's crops you're supposed to be growing down there. Tamara dutifully chuckled as Roshin turned his attention to the other nobles. Loskin of Silve was clad in an imitation of an imperial preacher, swathed in intricately arranged robes of gold and cream, and with a pair of pistols belted at his hip. Taking the term defender of the faith a little too literally, aren't we? said Roshin. Luskin shook his head. <sighs> if you had walked the Versacre as many times as I have, you'd know better than to mock Tarkel. 
Roshin ignored the rebuke and turned to Idrek of Planus, whose dusty skin and stoic demeanour made him all but unreadable. Even the taciturn Idrek couldn't help but look to the skies every few minutes with anticipation. Worried they'll not come, said Roshin. Idrek ignored him, and Roshin turned to the last of the nobles, Talabek of Vulcanus. Alone of his fellow nobles, Talabek wore an expression that looked like he'd just bitten into something unpleasant. Something troubles you, Lord Talabek? The man looked over and gave him the kind of look Roshin remembered from the Skolum just before Pastor Elevant would beat a child for misremembering an obscure fragment of Imperial law. This whole day troubles me, Lord Roshin, said Talabek. The man's voice was rasping and parched, which served him right for living on Vulcanus. All that heat wasn't good for a man's constitution or his temperament. It troubles you, said Roshin. Ah, this is a great day for us all. After, what is it again, Nuri? Two hundred and sixty-three years, my lord. Yes, after two hundred and sixty-three years. The servants of the glorious emperor, amongst whose number we can all count ourselves, have returned to Arcona. Today is a day for joyous celebrations and giving thanks for his beneficence. Then you're an even bigger fool than I thought. Roshin's life wards bristled at the insult, but Roshin ignored them. He'd sparred with Talabek enough in the palace debate chambers not to be phased by the man's boorish manner. An unkind interpretation of that remark might be to consider it treasonous, Lord Talabek. Is it treasonous to ask why the Imperium comes here now, after so long? It all depends on how you ask, I believe. Then why do you think they are here, Lord Roshin? Because we are a world of the Imperium, and it is our duty and honour to offer up our proud sons to fight in the Emperor's glorious wars, said Roshin. It is our seldom and most privileged task to serve his ineffable wisdom by being part of the holy machine that is his Imperium. Words were spoken by rote sneered Talabek. True, admitted Roshin, but I believe them. Can you say the same? My house has been preeminent among the noble houses of Arcona for centuries because my antecedents lived by them. You and others like you have grown soft, complacent, and too much in love with the rewards your position grants you, never once considering the duty such position requires no demands. Talabek hid it well, but Roshin saw his surprise. Well said, Lord Roshin, said Talabek with a short bow, but please do not mistake my natural caution with a lack of faith in the Emperor. I am, as we are all, dutiful and loyal subjects of the God Emperor. But where the Imperium walks, it does not step lightly. The first ship broke through the clouds an hour later. Not a single colour band failed to miss a note in their playing, and prayers faltered as every soul took an awed breath at the ship's incomprehensible scale. It seemed impossible that something so vast, monumental, could remain airborne, let alone traverse the stars. 
Like the craggy underbelly of an ocean-going leviathan, its metalled flanks were encrusted with gnarled growths, but of architecture and robust practicality instead of parasitic organisms. Vast holds gaped and spilled lambent illumination across a queer primus, the downdraft of enormously powerful repulsor fields made every banner snap and billow in electromagnetic thermals that made Roshan's teeth hurt. Only a portion of the ship was visible, its bulbous ventral structure protruding beneath the clouds. Who knew how large it truly was? Thousands fell to their knees, weeping at its sheer magnificence. <laughs> wondrous, just wondrous, said Roshin, the bass thrum of its vast engines almost obscuring his words. A bark of grating binary from the foot of the dignitary's pavilion grew his attention, and Roshin saw a number of red-robed priests of Mars making oddly geometric gestures across their chests. Ave, Deus, Omnissiah, said Talabek copying the gesture of the Martian priests, with his earlier unease seemingly forgotten. Adeptus Mechanicus! Roshin understood immediately. The lion's share of the wealth generated by Vulcanus was largely thanks to the array of forges and mining facilities thralled to the Martian priesthood. Roshin supposed it was only natural for Talabek to now view the identity of this sky colossus as a welcome sight. Dozens of smaller craft split from the main vessel and dropped through the lower atmosphere. Most were boxy and ungainly, looking as they ought to be drilling into a mountain instead of flying, but Roshin saw one that swiftly outpaced the rest and dived towards the landing fields, like a hunting raptor. Hard-edged and angular, its armoured flanks were a rich cobalt blue with crimson edging. Is that Mechanicus as well? asked Tamara, placing a protective hand across her stomach. I do not believe so, Lady Tamara, replied Talabek. It's Adeptus Astartes, said Luskin. Space Marines, said Tamara. A Thunderhawk, if I remember correctly, said Loskin. An assault craft. My great-grandfather claimed to have seen such a ship in his youth and painted many years later. It hangs in the great hall of my villa. An assault craft, you say, said Roshin, now wary of the rapidly approaching aircraft's predatory lines. His eyes were drawn to its brutal functionality, the enormous cannon on its dorsal surfaces, and the sleek missiles in its wing pylons. Luskin nodded. A gunship, he said, one hand instinctively curling around his pistol grip. Roshin raised an eyebrow and said, Are you planning on fighting these space marines? Luskin released the weapon with an embarrassed cough. The gunship flared its wings, slowing its hurtling descent at the last moment. Shearing jet wash battered clear space for tens of metres around it, and Roshin shielded his eyes as clouds of dust billowed over the platform, ruining the fabric of his pelisse and tunic. Hours spent polishing his boots wasted. Well, hours of Nuri's time wasted. He coughed and waved away the fog of hot grit and exhaust gases as a ramp beneath the prow of the gunship lowered. The dust obscured the disembarking crew, but even partially occluded, Roshin felt his heart thud against his chest at their inhuman scale. He had heard tales of the Adeptus Astartes, who in the Imperium had not, each retelling magnified their deeds and might until such warriors became little more than legends of immortal gods to walk in children's tales, mythic heroes conjured by fertile imaginations to vanquish evil. 
The dust settled, and Roshin now understood even the tallest of such tales fell woefully short of the truth. One space marine would have been awe-inspiring, but ten were marching from the gunship. Ten giants in strikingly blue armour, the heavy plates edged in crimson, and the eagles upon their plastrons forged from purest gold. They towered over a tall, elegantly willow-limbed adept in a robe of scarlet and slate grey. Roshin had seen enough tech priests to recognize another member of the cult Mechanicus. The adept's lower jaw was a ceramic death mask of acid-etched circuitry. His elongated skull tonsured with a fringe of silver hair, Arms formed from slender lattice works of multiple jointed articulations were in constant motion around him like mechanized snakes. A pack of goggled servitors bearing an assortment of books and analytical devices followed a respectful distance behind him. The adept appeared not to notice the armored giants surrounding him and tapped a black feathered quill stylus on a wood-framed data slate, with a pincered limb of engraved jet. The guards at the foot of the ramp leading to the platform stood aside, understanding that they could no more prevent the approach of the space marines than they could the approach of nightfall. Roshin pulled himself together and stiffened his spine. The Adeptus Astartes were titans of flesh and blood, but the adept, augmented as he was, remained a man. Titans in war-struck plate were one thing, but a man he could deal with, even one with ten space marines as an honor guard. Welcome to... began Roshin, but the adept lifted a bronze hand, palm outward. He did not look up. His eyes, softly glowing augmetics, Roshin now saw, scanned the slate. Confirm that this is planet Arcona, said the tonsured Martian adept. Segmentum Obscurus, Skyland Sector, Atreian Subsector, Imperial Cartography Designation 3997, Lambda Ultima Compliant. It is, said Roshin. And you are its Imperial Governor, Hereditary Biological Scion of House Roshin as ratified in Imperial Edicts laid down by the Adeptus Terra in the 251st year of the 3080 millennium. Roshian wasn't sure if that was a question or a statement, but chose to answer as though it was the former. I am Governor Tarkel Roshian, yes. Most excellent, said the adept, turning to the space marine nearest him. Before he could speak, Roshian said, and you are? The adept considered the question, as though his designation was of no relevance to Roshin. He paused, as though listening to an unheard voice. I am Adept Nyla, Secutor Tributi of the Adeptus Mechanicus, he said, making a quarter turn to point his quill stylus at the nearest space marine. And this is Sergeant Protus of the Ultramarines chapter of Adeptus Astartes. It is an honor to receive you, said Roshin. It has been 263 years since the Imperium last turned its benevolent gaze upon our Kona. We... 236, Terran Sidereal, corrected Nyla. The check digit in your plane's chronometers indicates an unverifiable deviation from the Astronomicon baseline. Oh, well, then we have even more reason to be thankful for your return, said Roshin. Enough, Nyla, said Protus, his voice impossibly deep and sounding like rocks in a grinder. We do not come to Arcona to discuss technicalities. We come to prepare for war. What war? said Roshin, taking a step back at the blunt force of the Space Marine's words. He knew the warriors of the Adeptus Astarte spoke, of course they spoke, but in the devotional hollow picts their voices had the lofty tones of heroes, not this atonal rumble. 
You are the governor of this world, said Protus. Yet you know nothing of the threat pouring from the eye. Threat? I know of no threat. The forces of the ruinous powers were strong, and our bitterest foe stands poised to unleash a black crusade. All the strength of arms must be yoked to the Imperium's defense, said Protus. Roshin turned to Nyla for clarification. The adept nodded and said, Arcona lies within the secundus tide volume of the Ocularis Terribus, a spatial anomaly more commonly known as the Eye of Terror, as laid down in Arcona's planetary charter, established in the 232nd year of the 31st millennium, you are oath-bound to supply such and material as decreed by the Departmento Munitorium whenever a threat of significant magnitude is declared by the reigning Sector Lord. Nyla finally deigned to meet Roshin's gaze. Such a threat has been declared. The nobles of Arcona looked up as the sky split with a thunderous roar. The bands fell silent as hundreds of ugly slabs of blackened steel dropped through the clouds on blazing columns of blue-hot fire. Enormous bulk haulers, freighters, refinery vessels and geoformers, all stamped with the cog-toothed skull of the Adeptus Mechanicus, a fleet of exploitation designed to strip the planet's resources and bear them to hostile war zones. Vast troop transports dropped like falling hab blocks, forcing entire regiments to scatter lest they be crushed underneath their inexorable descent. War demands its blood price, said Protus, stepping in front of Roshin, and Arcona will pay its share. Mm -hmm.